Welcome back, fellow trend following trading ideologues. The show is on the road today. As you know, it's from New York City. Beautiful Manhattan uh, was up here having some fun, and now it's time to get more serious and get down to business of talking about trend following. I had a good uh, time yesterday working uh, with the CMT group and uh, talking about my style of trend following. Um, we had a really good time. A lot of nice people. It was a, um, you know, it will be a podcast. So, um, from the CMT, they have a podcast. So I'll, I'm not sure when it's coming out, but um, my uh, <clears throat> daughter was in the audience, so she was like um, telling me afterwards. My youngest daughter, she was telling me afterwards. Um, yeah, when you would say certain things, people would go, ooh. <laughs> like, um, I don't know about that. That sounds kind of weird. So I was doing my best. You know, I like to sound a little crazy, a little weird. You know how we talk on this show, <clears throat> on, on our, when we get together. Um, controversial topics, but it was all a lot of fun. And um, yeah. That's about it. I haven't been paying much attention to the markets in the past couple of days. Um, <clears throat> I have been tweeting, but um, maybe Oleg can start us off. What's going on, Oleg? Hi, everyone. Hi, Richard. Hi, Brian. Hi, Seth. Alp. All the good. Uh, of course, I'm very happy. Hi, late all the conversation. We're thinking about our conversation every day. We're thinking about trading every day, about the markets, about trend following. Uh, was listening very nice uh, conversation between Mike Melisinas and Jerry, and did my notes, and it's really wonderful. Good day, Jerry. Good day, everyone. Yes, look, I'll just follow on from um, Oleg. I was listening to Mike Melisino's second episode as well with you, Jerry. That was interesting. Um, looking at uh, the trading tribe and how they operate. <laughs> so tell me, Jerry, what do you, what do you think about um, this uh, this trading tribe and you know things such as the psychology of trading? How do you uh, feel um, in relation to those aspects in relation to trading? Extremely important, less important? What do you think? I think it's pretty important uh, to have the right proper mindset to give yourself over to the to the system and, and your rules and try to work through these things. And sometimes it just takes time and practice to become a good trader. The uh, guy who was interviewing me yesterday, he wanted to talk about this quite a bit. And, um, you know, I get a little frustrated, but um, you're not going to hear anything different or new from, uh, from that interview and podcast, but you've heard it all. But, I just am really against people not embracing that what we do is hard and it works because it's kind of hard. You know, it's taking small losses, letting profits turn into losses, letting profits turn into small profits. And, uh, the, you know, it's just a difficult, thankfully, way of trading. And I think that rather than trying to um, come up with a system that suits your personality, that sort of concept really frustrates me. And I think it's better that people... Um, try to work through this and pursue the uh, the best possible way to trade and none of this stuff fits my personality and then if you really can't get over it the the bumpiness the drawdowns the volatility the the distribution the 40 percent winners then don't trade i mean that's my recommendation i'm a little intrigued by um you know so many people are into to more of this psych psychological aspect and i i reference that TV show Billions, where they have a psychologist on staff to talk to all the hedge fund traders. And so, yeah, I don't want to stand in the way of people, you know, getting their head right and thinking about things correctly, especially if it's going to lead to um, better trading and the pursuit of a higher and better way of doing things, irrespective of, um, you know, is it something that I can do? You know, the best system is the one that you can do. Well, no, it's not. I mean, obviously, that's not true. You know, it is for you, but it just locks in this idea that you've got to be a trader. You may not be cut out for it. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Richard? 
Yeah, look, um, I think psychology used to play a lot stronger role than it is that now, now to me, at least personally. And I was, I was thinking back to that and, you know, I, I tend to um, treat psychology when, I, when I've got this systematic application going on um, less and less as time progresses. So, you know, I'm not caught up looking at my screens all the time. I might, you know, pop into my screens maybe once a week to see how the portfolio is going. But mind you, that's only been after um you know trial and tribulation and slow confidence building on the execution of my systems that they're all playing out well um but um i'm now able to my mind is now can be focused on you know much more you know pleasurable pursuits and um a bit of research and development listening to other podcasts and um i find now that the majority of my time is certainly not looking at my screens or my portfolio and i think that's just a you know, a symptom that arises from more and more confidence in your system. You get less and less dependent on the psycho psychological aspects of trading. But inevitably, I, I assume with large accounts, you there is a, a level of psychology to it. But I certainly think it's not as great as many people might assume. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Richard. Hi, Oleg. Hi, Hi Roman. I mean, the, for me, the psychology is everywhere. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, my, my systems are, you know, fully automated. So I believe there should not be any psychology, isn't it? If the, you know, the robot is taking the next trade all the time, so, you know, someone else might think that, okay, so there is no psychology impact on it. But actually, it works quite the opposite. So you need the psychology to be able to determine, you know, your average winner's ratio to the average losers. So there's a psychology in determining that payoff ratio. So your win rate, would you, would you trade 30% win rate, 35% win rate, 40% win rate? That's definitely a psychology uh, question. Uh, would you like to use a cutback rule? Yeah, you know, because if you don't use a cutback rule, your system is going to be more profitable. So it is definitely psychology there, you know, Every, which markets to use to, to, to trade? There's a psychology there. You're not trading emerging markets. You're not trading Chinese ones, for instance. So psychology and machine works this together. And when people just, you know, don't uh, have uh, give uh, enough uh, emphasis on it, just because we are doing these things on a systematic basis or even on automated basis, it, it, you know, because... Whatever is automated, the execution is automated, but the research and development and choosing those parameter sets haven't been automated. So I say psychology is predominant in everything else we do, and the you know everything else, the, the machine side is much less. Even though execution might be uh, fully automated, I say uh, you know uh, everything else. You know, um, for me, it's almost hundred percent psychological. You know, there's you know. There is a psychology in everything else that we do. Every step that we decided to do. I mean, are you risking 10%? Are you risking 20%? Are you risking more than 20%? Are you risking 10 basis points per trade? Are you risking 15 basis points per trade? You know, uh, so how are you uh, managing your emotions while there are drawdowns happening? What are, what, how is your mental state when you 20% 20, 20 down? How is your mental state when you're 30% down? How is your ma mental state when you're 40% down? So what were you feeling when the 1987 happened? You know, what was, what was the feeling state when the interest rates have gone up with a big give up, with a gap up 600 and 50 basis points? So, or USC Phoenix Franks had crashed and there was an uncle point. What was the feeling state? I mean, you know, I... <laughs> You know, the more we talk about it, I say, you know, psychology is every, everywhere, every minute of it. It's just, you know, otherwise, every, you know, if it wouldn't be so hard, everyone else would have done it. Thanks. I think back to, um, you know, with my trading days in the 80s and 90s, and that was ridden with psychology and uh, the levels of risk I was trading with. It, 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 my, my, my psychology was incredibly volatile in nature. One day I'd be losing large amounts of money. The next day I'd be winning. And it was just incredibly volatile. But 
over the course of time with the systems and, and by reducing my bet sizes, there comes a point in time where suddenly the individual trade, the significance of an individual trade becomes immaterial. And uh, so I suppose if, if I was looking at my psychology now, it would be um, a, a psychological profile that was more volatile in terms of months than years and certainly in uh, you know individual trades or what's happening in the immediate moment. And um, it, it totally changes the way I address trading in that it allows me to stick to my rules um, with that um, much less volatile psychological nature. But if certainly if I was trading with the psychology I was trading in the 80s and 90s, um, you know, that was that was teaching me things about my innate nature. And I think psychology is something that is probably, to me at least, more important in the early days of trading in that there is this innate quality of human beings to um, be volatile in their psychological nature when uh, they're, they're slowly finessing their systems and looking at the psychological tolerance of risk and all of these different aspects. But as you get more and more ingrained in it, and I suppose there's also a level of indoctrination and belief in your system, but, um, you know, as you... You, you know, you slowly believe more in your system, in the capabilities of the system, in the capabilities of these rules based on back tests, the small bet size, the wide diversification in uncorrelated markets. It just allows you to sleep better and better at night. So ultimately, to me, there's, there is a sort of an inverse relationship between psychology and, um, and trading experience. I like that. I was going to say something similar. I think... Um... Yeah, I would get confused sometimes because I would have a lot of stress and I thought I needed to improve my systems and I uh, wanted to have a better, calmer life. But I would later realize that really what the problem was, was that I was just trading too large. I think you know that's certainly something that everyone has to choose that for themselves. That's the one thing that's definitely um, you need to sync up with your personality or your guy that can... Make, you want to make 10% a year with really small volatility and drawdowns, or are you going to be like Mulvaney or what something in between? So I was getting confused on my anxiety level. It was totally just due to trading too large. And then a um, the small bet size, trading a lot of markets, that helps more diversification. So it was just a function of maybe my body was telling me, you got problems you need to solve, but it's not necessarily in your head as much as well, it's in your head, but you need to improve those systems. And you just need to realize to what extent you can actually improve them and just live with it. They're not, no matter what you do, it's going to be some up and down times and it's nothing you can do about it. And um, you're just going to um, come to the realization that you can't improve upon the system you have by discretion or worrying about things. So you just need to embrace whatever that system gives you um but yeah i um i definitely agree that it's it's experience and learning and i do think though that what we do on spaces is a little bit of like tribism and psychology and encouraging each other and uh i think that helps yes so you know i, I totally agree with that so there's definitely an element of uh, you know, people with the same belief system coming together. But, I mean, in, even if you're going to look into, you know, established traders like Jerry Parker or Richard, you will see that they are not running, you know, Jerry Parker is trading like four decades. Currently, he's not trading his long-term system that he was trading in the 1980s, the 1990s. And then 2000, then 2000, then 2000, then 2020. And the majority of these decisions are, you know, how much leverage you're going to have, how much you're going to uh, size your bet. And I say psychology is everywhere. So, but the fact that you're running your system smoothly doesn't mean that psychology is less important. You know, the fact that you're running your system smoothly it means that you know you are, you are actually much more in line and uh, you know you you are, you are in a very much in a harmonious state with yourself however this, the importance of psychology is there 
because you have given those psychological decisions to be able to get there. So if the journey, if you're, if you're sailing in, in a nice and smooth way, this doesn't mean that actually the psychology is less important than other aspects of trading. It just means that, you know, uh, you, you, you happen to know your, uh, you happen to know yourself better and over time uh, you're able to run your system as it is. Thanks. Hi guys, can I ask you something? What do you think about, because something that I always think about is about passive investments. And I think that that product is trying to solve, or I think it looks like it solves many psychological issues. Because we all know that, that the, the, the passive investment is a bad product, you know, when you see it, uh, return and risk. But, you know, there's something about it, which is delegating the decision making to the fund manager, to the institutional fund manager and to the academia also, that it's kind of, okay, nobody makes a decision ever. So in 2008, things uh, divided by two, and then it looks like less people panic, and maybe I'm wrong, but less people panic because there's no decision maker. There is a community in, you know, in CalPERS or in any institutional fund that they don't do anything and so they don't panic and so as long as the thing is rescued over and over again uh, the psychology starts playing much less of a role until one day it, it will be maybe you know a permanent loss etc but you know when when i think of psychology i see it uh, attached to a single person decision making or individual decision making and given these new products and this new way ways of making decisions at least in the medium or, or short term looks like like it's re less relevant i don't know if you guys what you guys think about that hey uh thanks um the, the point i was i was uh, going to make is that um i think this uh psychological management so to speak is I think it's more important for discretionary traders because you need to be on top of your emotions all the time. Uh, whereas in our systematic space, we can um, divide the, the 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 way we we pay attention to things and uh, in uh, evaluating uh, if our systems are working, if our systems are the best we can we can do or good enough uh, to, to, um, to, to suit our needs. Um, when, you, when you're uh, on, on, on the weekends or when the market's closed or when you're not paying attention to the markets and you can um, go 100% uh, on a conscious level, on a rational level to evaluate your system and you don't need, uh, you, you don't suffer uh, the, the, the threat from your emotions to be jeopardizing you. And you're dividing that from the, from the moment when you're executing the system. And at that moment, you need to be a full robot and just execute, just do the trades, just follow the system and do nothing, nothing else. And um, when you're a discretionary trader, you're, you're um, doubting yourself all the time. You're doubting the your thesis your your um, um the the way you're seeing things and in that moment uh your emotions can get the best of you and that's why i think um uh uh, uh, uh um, emotional management is much more important at that level and well i'm, I'm repeating to myself now but from the when you're a systematic trader you you can it's it's Easier, I would say, but we have a, a method to do so. You just have to remember that the system you're executing is the best one you could uh, you could uh, come up yourself. And if it's not the best one, well, perhaps you should shut it off and get back to the drawing board and and uh, with a cool head design things from scratch, perhaps. Well, I don't think I can agree with that distinction between the two i think um it's pretty well documented that people have issues with following systems and they lose confidence just like a, a discretionary trader um i really uh i thought that <clears throat> the comment about i think 
Cordura was talking about the indexes in the S and P. So I think that's kind of funny. Uh, divided by two, that's good. Um, I think another thing about what you were saying is that uh, people, uh, they're all losing money together. And so we're all in it together. Um, if you're not losing the exact same amount that I am because you're not exactly in the S&P holding on, then you're probably losing a bit more or less because you're still in equities and they're probably all going down about the same. So I think there is some sort of um, unhealthy disregard <clears throat> of protecting your capital and doing what's best because we're all kind of in it together and they they're pretty hostile to um, alternatives because they have to you know lock arms and agree to each other that this is the way to do it this is what smart people do as their money has been cut in half and so i think it's kind of a realization that it doesn't have to be that way and that there is going to be and can be a day of reckoning and it's not just in the end does it stop working and do you go through long periods of um, not making money or losing money but you, if you retire if you need your money at some point in time you may have to take it out and not be able to hang on for this um, inevitable return to new highs which you know is not inevitable in my opinion so uh, but it's a very good um very good an analysis of the way most people think, I think what we're trying to do is to get people to see how trend following can not put people in that situation and to embrace doing something different. Uh, you know, I remember that was a big lessons that we were taught in the turtle class um, you know, to be nervous if everybody agrees with you and trading is lonely and you need to be <clears throat> your system, your trend following put you in situations where, you know, you you don't have similar outlook or similar positions that others might have and, and embrace that um, differences. And, yeah. Yeah. The other day I was speaking with somebody who was uh, looking at a system that had like a 25% drawdown. Right. And, and also at the same time, uh, he was comparing himself to the S&P and he said that he wouldn't want to lose that 25% drawdown. And what I think he was really saying was I don't want to lose 25% if I am the only one losing it. And he was, in his mind, prepared to lose a 50 or even a 90% in the, in the 30s on the S&P if everybody loses at the same time. And as you said, Cherry, I think I always get nervous when I, 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 everybody is, is, is thinking the same as I am. I am. I'm of the Groucho Marx school of life, you know, that I don't want to be in a club that accept people like myself. So I know what you mean by that. But sometimes it looks like until the time when you have to withdraw your money to live your life, everybody seems to be more confident if everybody else is doing the same, even if they are losing. I think, uh, yeah, I agree with that. And I think just the um, relative performance can really get you as well, especially if you're high-profile CTA and you're, you have a bad period and no one else seems to have a period as bad as you, that's, a, that's kind of the worst, you know. What am I doing? And I'll just say that, um, you know, I remember asking Rich one time, what is the biggest mistake we're going to make in trading? And he was like, this was like in the trading class. I was just like chatting with him in between, uh, you know, during the coffee break. And he would say, oh, you get knocked out and you and don't get back in. I said, okay, I can see that. Then he was like, well, the two biggest mistakes that people make are not following their system and trading too large. And I'll say that's 100% been the case for me. It all kind of gets back to, are you following your system and are you trading too large? And you know, I used to blame, I, used to, I couldn't really see that I was doing that and blame all kinds of feelings and performance um, and, and it wasn't the people, yeah, this is what I was trying to say. It wasn't so much that people were better than me, even though I felt bad at the time. It was that I was just trading too large and my system, um, uh, wasn't good enough or I changed it too much and I needed to revert back to, I've done a lot of research and <clears throat> made a lot of changes, but almost every one of them I had reverted back. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That's, 
it's taking profits too quickly or things like that. So, um, but that's the lesson. That's what I told the guys yesterday. Hang in there, uh, follow your system, and don't trade too large. So, Jerry, at the CMT meet you did the other day, can you remember uh, when your daughter said that they were raising their eyebrows and they were so concerned? Do you remember some of the topics you were talking about when uh, there was a bit of concern over what you were saying? No, she uh, didn't remember that. But, um, you know, this is just all the stuff that you guys, we always talk about, you know, trade level, um, all the markets, all the trades have the same expectation. Um, trend follow your stocks. Oh, love your drawdowns and um, trade with loose pants and don't worry about, don't worry so much about volatility and sharp. So it was kind of elementary, you know, because I was just trying to give them the basics <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> it was really fun to watch them squirm and disagree. A question. Um, so you, you've spoken a few times about um, over-optimization. Richard has spoken about, uh, you know, Gary Parker has spoken about. So what is the, and, and we also spoken about the fact that we can use the entire data set. But, you know, it's, you know, it's one thing that I have observed when I was in this uh, Society of Technical Analysts uh, forum two weeks ago, is, you know, people have a tendency to actually break their data into two parts. Okay, so they are in sample and out of sample. Uh, they, they've got an approach like that. And, and we don't approach, you know, our, our way of optimization is not the way, and uh, is not the way that they do. It. And, you know, if, if I'm not mistaken, they see it more as a curve thing to be able to use the entire set of data. But we have a different point of view on that. I mean, would it, would it be possible to clarify if that is all right? Thanks a lot. Yeah, so look, in, in relation to the in-sample and out-of-sample process, that's typically used by a trader that is, um, is um, capitalizing on a, uh, an edge that is predictable in nature. In other words, they're looking for a pattern or a repeating condition um, and in their in-sample component, if they have been effectively targeting their pattern, um, then they find that in outer sample performance, they shouldn't get a deterioration in their equity curve. That, now, the reason we don't do that is that um, the particular things, uh, features that we are hunting are very unpredictable in nature, these outliers. So, you know, when you apply traditional statistical techniques like in-sample or outer sample or when we apply things such as walk-forward processes where we segment our data um, into quartiles and see how performance is mapped in each quartile to make sure there's not a, a deterioration in the um, overall performance, we can't do that because we find our, our process is inherently volatile. Uh, when when trends do arrive, um, which we don't predict in advance, um, they might be constrained to a particular regime or a part of a regime or a particular region. And we can't guarantee that in the outer sample component or in the walk forward quartile, um, it's not telling us anything about whether our systems are working or not. But those that do use in-sample, out-of-sample, or those that do use walk-forward typically um, are convergent players that are looking at at um, a condition in the market that uh, they anticipate will continue in the future. And therefore, in the in-sample component, if, if their process is valid for that in-sample component, they'd like to see that continue on into the out-of-sample component. So, so does this mean that for volatility to manage CTA, it is possible for them to actually use their data and divide it into two um, because, you know, they are not trying to uh, capture the tails as we do. So um, it might make more sense to them, but um, is this, is this uh, reasonable, you think? You know, um, I, un I understand. Well, well certainly, yep, as an out, out, outlier hunter like, like um, some of us are here, 
Um, these outliers are certainly things that uh, we can't predict where or when they occur. So processes such as even Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo, Walk Forward, um, all of these processes are sort of, they're not, um, you know, very helpful for our method of identifying whether our, our systems are broken or not. So we need other methods. So I use a visual mapping method where I visually map my um, equity performance against the market data. So that tells me if my system um, is underperforming and I find that the markets uh, don't offer any material trends, then I know that my system isn't broken. That's just a necessary outcome of that relationship that exists between underperformance and the fact that the markets aren't offering trending opportunities. But if I find that my, my systems are performing well and I map that against the market data and I find that there are significant trends in the market data, that's a tick that my, my systems are working well. So in that, that case, I'm, I'm correlating performance of my systems to the actual nature of the market data. I'm not using a statistical technique, which um, fortunately in our world of outlier hunters, it's very clear um, when we have outliers in the market data, so we can see a direct relationship between our port performance and and, um, and and trending regimes. But for things such as mean reverting strategies or convergence strategies, it's not so explicit. It's much more difficult. And so um, these other processes are valuable to them, but they're certainly not valuable to me. But Richard, do you think that uh, outliers can be uh, systematically uh recognized, I mean, statistically or systematically or, or whatever, or do you have to do it uh, by, a, by a visual technique only? No, look, I, I, um, I think our process um, of uh, cutting losses and letting profits run is our method of, of targeting these features. And, and these features, to me, are universally present throughout the market data, but we just don't whilst they're universally present. And when I say that, what I mean is that when I look at the nature of all liquid market data, they have a long-term time frames. I find that all of them have this leptokurtic tendency. And so they all possess these fat tails and they also all possess these periods of time over the course of market history where they display these um, tail events and these, these outlines. But the thing is, you cannot statistically define when or where they're going to occur. So you need a process such as the process we adapt, uh, uh, we adopt in our technique where um, we are continually, um, we, we're basically trying to avoid trading the, uh, the noise and avoid trading um, the normal markets um, and, and participate only when we have these material trends. So what that does is it, it's trying to exclude a lot of those conditions that are not favorable for our process. So, you know, um, The, the Donkian breakout that we use for our breakout techniques has a, a long look back of, say, 100 periods, 150 periods, 200 periods. Now, what that long look back does is it means that price has got to significantly move for that breakout to occur. So fortunately, what we're doing, therefore, is we're excluding all of the noise and associated mean reversion that occurs before that entry signal is activated in hoping that um, when there is a material trend, we're significantly reducing the, um, the possible outcomes we participate in them to have a higher degree of potential chance that those material trends are going to turn into outliers. So we're significantly reducing um, what I call over-trading effects by only participating in material trends. And when you do have these material trends, you're typically late on entry where everyone's saying, goodness me, the trend's too mature, uh, it's going to revert. This is exactly the time that we get involved in these trends because we have such you know, long look backs and we're so selective and when we participate in these things. So therefore, we have a very low trade frequency per market, but because we diversify so widely with systems at across markets, that significantly amplifies our, our trade frequency because we're looking for this universal characteristic that we can't say when or where they occur. But the outcome of our process actually translates to saying five to ten percent of our trades are going to be, you know, significant outliers. Um, we we don't know which ones are going to be, so we've got to whenever our, our, our entry signals are triggered, we must participate. But we, because we can't, 
afford to miss any outlier. So unfortunately, we've got to apply that rule again and again and again and always take that entry, never miss that outlier. And the natural outcome of the process, given that they are a universal feature of these markets, is that over the course of a large data sample, we win. And for Dora, I think what, what Richard was just speaking about underscores your previous statement on the psychology and, and passive investing. And if you just simply, as I had kind of tried to tweet to you earlier, if you just went long above the 200 day and went flat cash, below the 200 day, the average person trading the spy would be infinitely more wealthy than sucking down the I think Josh down. is trying to say something, but we can't hear you. No, there was somebody speaking, but I think we are split like in two different networks and some some that don't listen to others. Jerry, would this be a time to introduce myself and start to engage in the topics and maybe ask a question or two? Sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's my first time speaking on spaces, although I've been listening to you guys for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and it's been part of my education. I do have voice challenges, so please forgive my scratchy voice. Sometimes it returns to full body, and uh, often it's just a pain in the neck. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, Jerry, I can't wait to see your TFPN ETF. Very excited. Um, are you still on track with that? Yes. So the ETF <clears throat> is on track, making good progress. It, um, I'm prepared to for it not to be perfect um, <clears throat> and trade a bit different. Uh, maybe some limited markets um, versus the private fund, but it doesn't look like that's going to be necessary. So it could just be a full-blown best ideas. Everything that I do daily on the private fund will will be part of this ETF. It'll be a bit different in leverage. It'll be less uh, volatile, less less leverage than the private fund. So, <clears throat> But other than that, it doesn't look like I'm going to have to make any compromises, although I'm prepared. I'm ready. You know, who knows? But um, I would say sometime in July, it'll be up and running. Great. I will be one of the first investors knocking on that ETF door through my, um, probably through my retirement fund and also in my retail um, access. I have a Fidelity IRA, um, about 220 grand. And um, relatively small investor, probably for these spaces, um, but no less enthusiastic and no less fascinated. And then I have, you know, super small account at Robinhood, which is where things really started for me seriously back in 17, when I realized I could buy a share of uh, realty income and it would pay me, you know, four something percent every, you know, annually with money hitting the account every month with no fees and no commission, and no 100 lot minimum. And this started my whole, this started me. <laughs> I started small, and now I'm up to the heavy stuff. And trend following is where I've kind of found my way with this kind of grand sensibility of no predicting. This has so rocked my world because, you know, sorry, but it has crept into every other part of my life. This notion of I don't need to predict to survive. I've already kind of predict plenty and survive plenty, and I don't need to do anything about that. It's kind of built in. But all this kind of incessant application of this means that, or um, I'm pretty sure I'm speculating this will be the case, uh, my trading has really uh, evolved and elevated because of the trend following. Thanks. Yeah, that's good. Um, it's good to hear. I um, I was able to meet with, uh, you know, have some uh, dinners this week and talk to some clients, and uh, they were given a, a similar story that, um, yes, I like to trade, yes, I like to learn, um, but I'm also going to allocate to CTAs that, um, you know, 
<clears throat> know what they're doing, have a track record, and and so it's that's that's a great thing about trend following. You can have your fun, do your thing, and if you want to allocate to um, CTAs, you can do that as well. So glad that glad you're here, and glad and keep coming back, and keep those questions coming. Brian, are you still on with us? Do you want to finish what you were saying? Uh, yes, sir. I was just going to say, um, you know, and, and it kind of dovetails nicely with what Josh was saying. If if the average person just, uh, you know, went long on a weekly close above the 200 day and then went to cash on a weekly close below that 200 day and wait for price to resume, but keep putting money in their account when they can reload, they would be infinitely more wealthy and it would go along with the premise of what you said in a couple of the uh, top trader episodes and you've said in these spaces, which is just to, you know, throw a little trend in there and and then, you know, the money will follow. And uh, uh, with that, I'll, I'll get off. But I would like to say one more thing, which is previously, I think before COVID, we had discussed maybe having a... Uh... I've lost Brian. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Ryan, we lost you. At uh, the crucial moment. <laughs> G'day, Josh. How are you? Uh, it's good to hear from you again. Josh and I have touched base before. But um, mm. it, it's interesting, Josh, um, this this discussion about prediction, I, I assume at the CMT conference, that might have been a time when the, the people might have been raising their eyebrows because a, a lot of the... The fields in technical analysis, um, you know, work on the principle of of prediction. In other words, you know, they're looking at technical price patterns and they're assuming that price will do a certain thing after these, you know, price patterns have been met. But that that's different to a reactive process, which is a you know price following process. And um, I think I when I ever presented these technical analysis um, events. Um, that's that's when I certainly do get a lot of raised eyebrows. But to me, this brings a question: um, when when you are less concentrated or less diversified than say uh, we are, um, you tend to because you are less con you you are more concentrated um, in a particular stock or a particular class of stocks or whatever. You tend to get into the game of timing. Um, and that's something that diversification, diversification allows you to avoid because with a very diversified portfolio, your emphasis totally re reverts away from any need to time the markets or time anything. You just, you have your allocation, your diversified allocation, you let it run with the signals are generated um, through your systems and there is no sort of timing involved apart from the fact that your systems have been developed using very large data sets that have said, this is when I'm going to enter, this is when I'm going to exit. The rules are always the same. They're always preserved uh, through the course of, of your history, but it totally changes the emphasis away from any need to predict the market um, because you know you've got your, your very diversified portfolio of very small bets applied across a huge diversified range of return streams and you can just let it run. And that, that, that's something to me that totally reduces the psychological pressure of having to know what the market's going to do next. Um, you know, um, when I was less diversified back in the, 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 the 90s and so, um, you know, my, my every day I'd wake up thinking, what's the market going to do? How am I going to sort of jump on board an opportunity or whatever? And I'd always be predicting that since I've got involved in this highly diversified systematic process um, that I use now, all sort of um, all the pressure of having to time the markets totally dissipated, um, making it. Uh, you know, I just apply these rules; um, they they work, and I don't have to get into this predictive mindset. Uh, Richard, you know, one of the points that we discussed in, you know, again this uh, technical analysis workshop was with the choppy trend following systems. Okay, like short term daily data bar systems, like you know, fifty. 50 or 60 uh, days look back. So a conversation was just to use, to use a profit target because it's already a choppy system. I, and I know that, you know, you have mentioned earlier, you know, one of your systems is 
quite uh, short term when it comes to uh, trading daily bars. Uh, I wonder, have you had a chance to back back test a profit target with uh, with a short term system and whether it is you know improving it or um, making things worse? I mean, I'm talking about a really choppy system here. You know, not in it, not nothing like a long term system. Thanks. Yes, Alp. So I have tested on short-term systems with profit targets. And to me, what they're doing is, um, so in my world of, of trend following where I'm targeting these outliers, um, it, you're, you're exploiting a different edge with short-term momentum systems. So, you know, I often say, um, you know, really everybody in the market um, targets trends. They might be mean reverters targeting um, a, a trending cycle in a mean reverting pattern. Uh, they might be people that jump onto trends with no material significance and they can be random trends. You find trends everywhere throughout the market. Um, and so the short-term trader, I believe, is applying a momentum technique, which to me is significantly different to a trend-following technique. And a momentum technique, for instance, can be exploiting mean reverting patterns. So the reason why a profit de target is deployed for uh, uh, a mean reverting uh, method of trend-following is because... Um, you know, with, with a mean reverting cycle, you get a, a price excursion away from an equilibrium or a mean and then a reversion back to that mean. So you need to put your, your profit target. Uh, these trends aren't enduring in nature. They they tend to be short, short momentum bursts that bring you back to the equilibrium point. So you need a profit target in that context. But I don't use them because that's a convergent methodology, which... Um, I have found um, with short-term momentum systems that you can be caught with a bit of negative skew in them. And so I've elected to um, always apply these golden rules that I do um, to ensure that I'm um, addressing the tails and not being um, enticed to target other forms of trend that don't meet my, um, my requirements for being um, possible um, tail contributors. Now, one of the things that... Um... <clears throat> They did before I spoke or interviewed yesterday was they put they ask a, they had a poll uh, how many people in the room are trend followers and how many or value growth or some other type of strategy and I think ninety seven percent of the people were trend followers so that was good I do think that um, you know using momentum or trend a bit here and there <clears throat> you know is a far cry from systematic trend following so. I'm not sure it's going to work. I mean, I hear what Brian said, and I think that it's probably better if you if you have a bad some bad ideas, to maybe have a stop loss or go with use trend a bit. But it's not going to be nearly as good as a fully systematic approach. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to, I forgot when I was all done. I wish I had said was like the uh, that tweet I had with uh, Druckenmiller, who, you know, I think he's really a great guy and really successful, but just the contrast between a systematic trader and someone like him, who I think probably uses trend. <clears throat> I went to one of his annual meetings when he was still trading many years ago and uh, read up about him, but he probably had some trend ideas and small losses and things like that. But I think it's just kind of funny that these um, guys want to make this big, huge claim. You know, he's he's just like, okay, short the dollar. And uh, what does that even mean, short the dollar? I mean, who talks like that? I mean, uh, there's 50 currencies out there. And um, why don't you just say I'm going to be long the, some of these currencies? Which ones, right? And uh, <clears throat> in contrast, he makes this big, huge claim. And um, okay. And then people like that because they want to worship this someone like this. And then I'm like, well, you know, I'm long Mexico. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> long the euro, short Canada, short Aussie. I've got these nuanced positions. They're all trend-based. I'm very happy with them. Do you really think over time that that is not going to do better than um, walking into the bar and putting your big six-shooter on the bar and telling everyone that you're going to be short the dollar. I mean, who talks like this? And uh, I think over time, when you're diversified and you're systematic, the chances that someone can reliably beat you um, is so low. And just uh, 
<clears throat> implement this a full blown uh, <clears throat> trend following approach. And you're going to, even with your little money that you have in, in your small account, you know, that you're almost destined to be as good or better than people with amazing research, amazing backgrounds, and who, to his credit, he admits all the time uh, his big mistakes that he makes. And so stay away from these big mistakes by diversifying and using a systematic approach. And um, I remember Paul Jones being like uh, so <clears throat> upset that he missed that big, um, the big short, you know, 2008 or whatever, <clears throat> and said, where was this? No one was telling me about this big trade. And, uh, and how did I miss this? I can't believe the biggest move of all time I wasn't in on this. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, that's the way it is, you know. We make these uh, profits. We have the stability. We follow these trends with lots of different markets. And we don't make the front page when they get it right. And we don't make the front page when they get it wrong either. Okay. So and here's another question. Now, one of the other um, things, uh, subjects that we discuss in Society of Technical Analysis Forum was well, the use, use of, uh, instead of using a, you know, we, we, we keep on saying that we have to use a stop loss. And one of the suggestions was to, to use a, a put option for a long trade. So, and we'll look into the differences of using a put option. So you, let's say that you're long uh, cable uh, pound dollar and uh, you would like to put, you know, um, a stop to a meaningful distance. But what would be the difference instead to use a put option? Now, the... so. So there are pros and cons when you use a put option, like the costs are a little bit more because you have to pay the premium, but you're not going to have any gap risk associated with that, so on and so forth. So I wonder, you know, experienced traders, uh, you know, like decades, like Richard and uh, Jerry Parker, have, have you used, have you given any thought about using uh, options and, and the cost structure, whether it w would it be worthwhile uh, adding as part of the strategy. Thank you. I thought about it over the years. I talked to option people over the years and tried to explain to them, you know, why it looks like an option strategy would work. But I, I think that the cost of the premium is far exceeds the um, reduction in gap risk and things like that. So I think uh, no, none of the big traders, none of the big CTAs, with unlimited resources, uh, do this. So I think it's a pretty, I think uh, I think it's a pretty safe assumption that um, trend following, tr as it tries to replicate options a bit, with the small losses and unlimited upside, options can't do a good job of replicating the trend following. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd agree with that, Jerry. It, look, there's there's always a time to expiry as well. So your your option, the benefits of it deteriorate over time. to time to expiry. So there are all of these additional variables in an option, whereas a stop is sort of um, I regard it as a free um, insurance premium as opposed to a costly insurance premium like options. But you know when you're looking at the benefits of short term convexity. You know, uh, in relation to the fact that, well, with the medium to long term trend followers, um, they're often slow to the party. So when they're riding these very big trends and there's an inevitable change in trend direction, um, they get hit um, in the early stages of a, of a correction um, because it takes time for their their models to sort of adapt to that situation. I've, I've looked at that closely, and I think that's more a problem of being too over-correlated in the portfolio as opposed to a problem of trying to fix it with short-term convexity, like options, plays, short-term momentum, all of those things. Um, so, you know, when I look at um, how do I reduce the impact of these short-term corrections on my total portfolio, um, I'm looking at, at it as, well, what is causing the significant hiccup or the, you know, like last month, what is causing for some trend followers a 15, 19% drawdown in a single month from the influence of the, the bond market correction? Well, to me, 
that tells me that you are too overexposed to bond markets or, or markets that are correlated to bond markets. And that's why it's such a large negative impact on the portfolio. So rather than try and fix it with, um, you know, options or, or um, that, that style of technique to try and, you know, get some short-term convexity into your portfolio, I look at it going more fundamentally to, right, my, co- my portfolio is inherently too correlated. I've got to break down those correlations. And the way I do that is through system design, implementing more different types of trend following system to reduce the, the inherent correlation that exists in the portfolio at the market level. And, you know, perhaps consider, you know, diversifying into um, assets that uh, have a, a much less correlated nature. Um, so, you know, I think the problems of a lot of traditional trend followers is that their portfolios are inherently too correlated or they might be US dollar denominated uh, for the majority of their assets, which causes a major correlation to um, the US dollar. Um, I think there are ways we can break down that level of um, correlation, which therefore reduces the impact of those short-term corrections on our portfolio by looking at it from a correlation basis as opposed to a, you know, get more convexity into the portfolio. Yes, you know, you, you, Richard have, and I and possibly, uh, you know, Jerry Parker and Richard have, do agree with on this point, but I, I, I do have a slight tangent in the sense that, you know, in last year, you know, you, a good trend follower would have traded credit portfolio with a lot of bonds into it. You know, and when I look into, you know, uh, some of the uh, known CTAs like, you know, Down Capital, and when they, they do have this 60% annual return, all right, so they are giving some, some portion of it back during this year. And it all makes sense. You know, it all makes sense. I mean, it's, it is not good to think about these monthly performances from a viewpoint of an accountant. It's just not, you know, it's, it's, when you look into the performance from um, at least, you know, maybe four months, four to six months, so there's a story there, you know, bonds gone up, you made some money, bonds gone down, so you lost some money. But it is, it is all, all coming back to the, the managing risk. And so long as you can manage the risk, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of having the diverse part portfolio incorporating bonds. And, um, you know, and I think there's a lot of value into it. And, you know, uh, and when I listen, you know, Richard and the way he describes the system, uh, you know, he's, he's doing quite uh, interesting stuff with using multiple entry systems uh, to be able to, uh, you know, prime it up on the same outlier, so which is very, very good technique, but also, you know, um, there is no harm in, you know, trading the, the bonds and the credit uh, markets if you can manage the risk well. Thank you. So I, I think I do it a bit different. <clears throat> I have a different um, way of looking at this than Richard. Um, number one is that I'm not willing to trade systems that aren't really good. So that really limits me on adding systems that are very different. So I trade these long-term trend-following systems, and they're very similar. Um, <clears throat> they can absolutely all get in on the same day, at the same price sometimes, and then exit as well on the same day at the same price. But they'll do really well if, if we've had a nice trend, and even though they're very highly correlated, because I want them to all be long in an uptrend. But when I start getting out of profitable trades, okay, so the exits will be different. They'll be more different. There are these breakout exits. And um, so I'm not getting as much difference in, uh, I'm not breaking down up this correlation in the bonds because they all went up. But if any got elected, maybe a couple positions, I got out of some bonds, but um, it, it's very similar. I trade the bonds small because there's not that many of them. So as it relates to stocks or, cur- or commodities and currencies, the only thing that saved me was not breaking the correlation. It was the fact that it's the smallest sector I have because it's the fewest markets I have. Um, and, you know, that's 
And I'm sticking with other things that Richard has told me and mentioned on this that I also already knew and maybe had just sort of um, relaxed my opinion on this. And that is um, this idea that I'm going to trade these. I'm going to happily trade uh, and on purpose trade markets that are highly correlated. Um, Brent and WTI. I'm short. I'm just looking at like, like five wheat contracts, South Africa, Kansas City, Minneapolis, French, and Chicago. And they're all going down. And um, it's not a diversified position. And there's almost no system I'm willing to trade that's what? It's going to make me less short? They're good downtrends. I'm making money in these. Another thing, too, is that I'm trading 300 markets. So um, I, on purpose, uh, do not do anything about correlation, and I over-trade wheat and some of these other markets on purpose, and I'm like, oh, who cares, because it's five positions out of 300, and so it can't be that much on a daily basis or monthly basis. It has to almost go 80 ATRs or 100 or 200 ATRs to become an outlier before it can even matter to my portfolio very much. So that's another edge that I have as well. So, um, yeah, I find it impossible. I don't care how long I trade. I'll never f be willing to do a lot about the correlations um, because I'm not willing to trade systems that are materially different from the best ones I can find. And Jerry, sorry, I know that you don't, don't, don't implement any correlation control on, on, on your systems, but when you look at the assets, do you care about whether they are correlated uh, when they go up or down. Because, for example, when, the other day we were speaking with some colleagues about geographic diversification. And that's something that it's really er eroding and through the, the, the decades now being in one country or another doesn't make that much of a difference. But that's especially true when they go down. When they go up, they, they kind of uh, add the diversification in the same way that you mentioned all your different uh, uh, crude oil or energy futures. So I know that you don't do it when you implement, but do you care about upside versus downside correlation or when you see those futures? I mean, I care about it, and I, but I am going to stick with the other principle, which is they're correlated, and then all of a sudden they're not correlated. So heating oil has doubled a few times in, my, in the past, and crude kind of just sat there. Silver had a huge move in 87, and gold kind of sat there. And I'm anticipating that it has a different name, and that is all it needs to have, because at some point in time, it is going to, it could possibly be different and have this outlier, and then go right back to being highly correlated. And, um, but I only care about correlation during the setup. It's all about the proper setup. So I am happy with my allocation to bonds. I trade as many as possible. It's a smaller allocation because there's not that many bonds. So I'm very concerned about the diversification and the correlation when I set up the portfolio. Then I'm done. Then I'm done. Yes. Okay. What happens when all the bonds go down and then they all go against you in March? Yeah, I mean, it's going to happen, and I'm not going to like it. Are you happy if this happens? Are you prepared? Yes, I am prepared. And that's the key. Be prepared and then live with it, and, and then do that rather than ball control, uh, correlation control, doing these speed trades where, okay, things are out of control. I've got too much on. I'm giving back too much profit. Do some sort of uh, cutback somewhere. Um, that's what I'm against. Okay, so um, now that Jerry Parker talks about, uh, you know, that he doesn't actually have a lot of bond instruments, he's a credit instrument in his portfolio. Actually, he's talking about his deep core beliefs about how markets work, how life works, and this is psychology 101. So, this is actually his telling us, you know, how his psychology is all about. And that's a very good testament for me 
to to see someone else's psychology about life and and the markets and you all you are all possibly coming back to you know fund up famous saying that you you don't trade the market but you trade your beliefs about the market because you know now someone else like uh Jerry Parker could surely have access to more uh credit instruments and more bonds because there are lots of corporate bonds there are lots of CDSs and whatnot and with his resources it would be very much possible to construct a portfolio you know very differently than the uh, the government bonds that he's trading at the moment so for me that choice is, is happening at the psychology level first and he he chooses to believe something else and then he goes with that belief and you know when we come back to the initial part of the conversation where the psychology is important yeah it's it's almost 100% it's just there you know and it is it is just getting out on that limbic belief that we we discuss thank you just something on the system diversification so if you could imagine like i do trade very highly correlated markets so i trade sugar and i trade london sugar for instance but i'm trading it with an ensemble of trend following systems so if you could imagine the the correlations that we worry about are the correlations that are the result of our trade outcomes how correlated are our trade outcomes so that's a that's a combination of about what both the market is doing and what our systems are doing how how they're exploiting that market opportunity so if you could imagine a single trend following system like a donkey and breakout applied to london sugar um and you use the same parameter sets on a donkey and breakout system for for sugar um you find that um the trade outcomes between both are highly correlated then when you um increase the number of trend following systems and each trend following system is um uniquely configured um where you're not optimizing for the best system for that particular market but you are you're ensuring that your entries your exits your your um ATRs your trailing stops etc are all sort of inherently unique they still you know offer a weak edge over very long term testing but they're all uniquely configured the more and more systems you apply to say sugar and then you apply those same bundle of systems in 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 this case I'm currently trading 10 systems for sugar and 10 systems for london sugar you find that the level of correlation between the two markets significantly decreases and i put an example up on my twitter feed this week where i compared and contrast the the performance results between sugar and london sugar now the markets themselves sugar and london sugar have been highly correlated about 0.92 very highly correlated over over the period i was measuring in this case i was looking at the trending period between 19 uh, sorry um 2020 up until current day and i found that um because of the small variations that occur in the market data plus the application of these ensemble of systems these small variations are sufficient to create a significant difference in the trade outcomes of both london sugar versus sugar and i'm finding that um that the the nature of the returns of the ensembles on both are significantly less correlated than if you're simply only trading a single trend following system to both those markets so to me that tells me that we can do something on the system side of things to significantly reduce the level of correlation so i'm a, I'm a big fan of using um systems as a way to um that decorrelate my portfolio to allow me to trade um some of these highly liquid but correlated markets and that's why I trade brent and crude um I I trade a lot of these instruments but I'm finding that the result over the long term is a far less um uncorrelated relationship than if I was only applying a, a you know a small number of systems or one system to um all of my different markets no yes you know I agree with that. I agree with that totally. And that's what I was trying to say. I could you said it much better, much clearer, but yeah, that's perfect. And um I 
And then that allows you to trade these uh, markets that are very similar and get different P&L, different, different trade outcome, to use your word. So, yeah, that's exactly the way I look at it. However, um, the, I think I said this last week or the week before, the bonds are a bad example to make that point because they were all um, hugely profitable and any diversification that we got from those bonds were is going to be in that out um, the profit outcome and 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 then so there's no way to criticize or to have any regrets over what happened in march because that is outside of this idea of diversifying the PL, giving all that profit back um more some people gave a lot back some people did not some people had a lot more profit to give back because they made 50 60 70 percent last year and somehow mulvaney he did better than everyone right he makes all the money and then doesn't give much of it back uh well during this little period so yeah there is no criticism of being overly correlated um not diversified enough as it relates to march in those bonds because that falls outside of this brilliant argument that you just put forth, which is that it's all about the P&L. Now, if you only trade bonds, you trade too many bonds. Um, bonds are the biggest part of your portfolio for some reason. I'm not saying it has to be like me and be the smallest because it's the smallest number of markets, or at least in my portfolio, as Al was saying, my portfolio, uh, that you don't have problems. Yeah, you've got kind of some problems and stuff, but the mere fact that um, you... That you trade a lot of bonds, they're highly correlated, you need to go back to the drawing board and prevent what happened in March. No, I don't, I don't think so. Okay, a question. Yes, Jerry. It, it's interesting that um, uh, those trend-following funds that were highly exposed to bonds really suffered last month. And if you consider um, the nature of bonds, they tend to be, um, un when they're unleveraged, they tend to be the le least volatile of all of the, the markets we trade. Um, there's this known sort of um, coupon yield developed by them. They're, they've got very limited volatility. So naturally, when when people apply, um, you know, ATR best based techniques, etc., to size their trades, they find that they are applying a fair bit of leverage to these highly um, less volatile, sorry, these far less volatile bonds. And that, you know, for the last 20 years, they've done very well, very, very well on that principle of having a significant exposure of bonds in their portfolio. But suddenly we find last month that the volatility of bonds um, reached levels that had no historic precedent. We suddenly found that these bonds, which were you know, quite low volatile instruments, suddenly had this massive volatility. And lo and behold, those, um, those funds, which were highly exposed to bonds because of the effectively they are curve fit for the last 20 years to chasing performance this is this is a nasty way of saying it um you know they they find lo and behold they suddenly get hit with a 15 19 percent um impact um you know even even trans were impacted significantly um ahl was significantly impacted last month and and you know whilst everyone was singing the praises of these funds for so many years um, you know, you wonder whether it's, um, you know, whether that they are effectively over-optimised to a particular favourable regime with a bit of leverage engaged in their, um, their portfolio. So suddenly, um, you know, they were caught short-footed. And yet the people that did very well last month were actually the classic trend followers. Mulvaney, yourself, Jerry, you suffered um, limited sort of adverse volatility last month. Um, you know, and, and we find that um, in this instance last month, Classic trend following had a major tick to all of those other programs that were using correlation measures, volatility scaling, volatility adjustment, all of these clever techniques. They found that they were short footed. Um, you know, so, you know, it was very interesting last month. Yeah. I mean, just a quick question. Now, we're talking about this correlation thing. So, and, the, and Richard Brennan is saying that, you know, we're going to trade the grants and the crude at the same time. And you're not going to cut one of them due to correlation because he's actually explaining the fact that because one in one of them you might end up with an outlier so uh to be able to have a pnl impact to be able to catch that outlier 
you're going to trade Brent and the crude oil at the same time, which is fair enough. Uh, but it, because, it is fair enough because there are only so many commodities and there are only so many uh, forex instruments and there are only so many uh, credit instruments. So the question is, when it comes to trading stocks, because, you know, my broker is providing like more than 10,000 stocks, okay? So I really do not have any problem with thinking about, you know, uh, the brand or the crude or the sugar or the London sugar, because these are so limited number of instruments. So would you, would you consider relaxing, not using the correlation uh, assumption, because we have so many thousands and thousands of stocks and to be able to, you know, minimize drawdown, perhaps implementing a correlation approach would help while trading the stocks. What would you think about that? Thank you. You go first, Jerry. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to hear the question. Alp has a lot of background noise. Um, what was the question, Richard? Can you paraphrase? The, the question was, given um, Alp's focusing now on stocks, and there's, there's thousands of stocks to select from, um, and given the discussion we've just had was it saying, don't be too concerned about correlations because we're tra chasing outliers and we find that small variations in highly correlated stocks with, you know, these different trend following systems produce significantly different outcomes. Should we relax our assumptions about our worry about correlations in stocks? Um, and um, so, yeah, I think that's what he was out asking. Yes, I agree. We should relax. I mean, I, I searched. There's so many stocks to choose from. You can't trade them all. I don't have a good answer for this. I'm just going to say I got to think about my answer and I got to think why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> OK, but I'll finish my answer. And that is I am obsessive about finding a lot of stocks and putting them in my portfolio. And my only criteria is liquidity and diversification and, and being different. Um, I don't really look at correlation matrix so much as just, hey, this is an egg stock. I don't have any exposure to eggs. Am I going to get egg exposure with an egg stock? Well, maybe, sometimes. I don't know. Uh, then I'll do a French fry stock and a potato chip and um, shipping, insurance. Okay, so it's pretty easy. Put together this portfolio. Maybe you want to trade one or two. Um, certainly, if there were two egg companies, I would trade them both. And then crude sits there, and I've traded Brent, and it's a futures market. And I'm like, oh, heck, I'll trade both. Because, you know, you could get some difference. And there's not a lot of energy contracts. You know, heating oil, unleaded, crude, um, Brent, they're different from that gas. It has different moves. And, uh, okay, so maybe that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I don't have that much uh, energy anyways. It's only, you know, four or five futures markets. Uh, but in stocks, oh, I'm not going to trade, you know, maybe four or five oil companies because I'll just trade a couple and I'll go find some more diversification. So I don't think I, my, I don't like my answer as much uh, contrasting uh, what I do in futures versus stocks. But in stocks, for sure, um, I'm going to be much more diversified. And then I'm going to say, well, heck with it. Yeah, this is my analysis. Heck with it. I'm going to trade Brent and WTI. I don't know. Jerry, is this a good time to share about my experiment in single stocks, trading 5,000 of them? Um, I remember you telling me about this. Um, yeah, I, you know, another thing, too, is um, it's very important to have a fixed universe of markets. So... I'm going to apply these systems uh, every day the same way, Not try not to change my systems, handle every trade the same way, but I want to handle them on a consistent group of markets. Because you don't have to trade every market. You can't trade every stock. I mean, I can't. So I don't, I think that's another important thing that I learned a long time ago, which I don't know if anyone else does that, maybe a few of us, the classics. But that's another thing, too, that doesn't get talked about as much. Um, the importance of taking every trade, thus you can't trade every market. You can't afford uh, some, you're going to have to bypass some trades if you, if you try to trade everything, all the different stocks. At least I don't know how you would do that. But yeah, so I think 
a fixed universe rules out for me um, trading 5,000 stocks. So what I first learned about trend following from Covell, he was a guest on a Dan Ferris podcast in um, Thanksgiving of 21. I signed up for Covell's course and I studied it and I found errors. I'm a typo freak and completeness freak and I, you know, communicated errors that I found in his stuff. But it was great because it 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 forced me to pay attention. I kind of joked to myself that Covell left those errors in and didn't correct them so that people studying his stuff would have to deal with finding the errors and think that they'd found something. But part of my learning, and as I took on wanting to have this trend following experience, you know, and pips and ticks, and I couldn't quite get my hands around uh, potatoes and um, crude. And I thought, you know what, I'll leave this to the experts. So I discovered Jerry, and I discovered Dunn, and Jerry's uh, 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 mutual fund is the main holding in my retirement account, just as a disclosure. And I have smaller positions in some of the smaller ones that are in the SOC Gen index, the 40 Act mutual fund version of those that I could find in some ETFs over in my Robin Hood including um, Andrew's uh, replication experiment. Anyway, so then I realized that Jerry's private fund, which I didn't yet have the the, uh, capital for, was including single stocks that the mutual fund was not the um, EQCHX, which I love. So I decided that at my Robin Hood, I would have an experiment since I could buy fractional shares of stocks, I could buy a dollar's worth of a stock at minimum, a dollar. Um, and that somehow this thrilled me because I was, I remember hearing Jerry talking about equal application. I thought, I'll just put a dollar into as many stocks as I could find. So I, I used my CSI data account and got rid of the correlation cost and who cares if things are correlated or not. Why do I need to impose that on myself? I, I looked at, at, at a universe of 5,712 stocks. And every day, my, you know, now I'll tell you my secret sauce, which is not even, you know, nascent. I look for a 200-day high. And if I find one, I put a dollar into it. <laughs> and then if it's got a, a greater than three 14 day OTR differential to the underlying, then I just close it. Typically, it's about a 9% loss. But I've been profitable since day one. Another lesson I've gotten from Jerry I'm up 11.3% as of last night on my 330 currently held single stocks. And it's just like me tending the garden every day. Some fall off, and I let those beanstalks rise. Thanks. Yeah, I like that. That's interesting. We, we need to get into that. I need to think about that some more. Okay, I'm being called away. We're on vacation, and I'm not uh, paying enough attention to my wife. And uh, I'm going to start doing that. And uh, start to cut it short. I'll make it up uh, in the following weeks. <clears throat> Thanks for the lively conversation. I always appreciate it.